Hi, my name is Steve Taylor and this is my Garden Talk. I'd like to begin with a, a quote from the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche said, if you have a why to live, then you can endure almost any how. And what he meant by that was that if you have a, a strong sense of direction, if you have a goal that you're moving towards, and you feel as though you are heading in that direction towards the goal, then it gives you the motivation and the determination to overcome obstacles. It enables you to face and overcome challenges which would normally overwhelm you. And um, that's what I want to talk about in this talk. I want to discuss the amazing power of purpose, how purpose can lead to improved mental and physical well-being, how it can even extend and improve our lives. Our lives. And that applies both to physical health and mental health. Both of them are incredibly uh, sensitive to the power of purpose. I'd like to begin with a story which illustrates that. And it's a story of an Austrian psychologist called Viktor Frankl, who was born in 1905. And he was just, when the Second World War broke out, he was beginning his career as a psychologist. And he just finished the manuscript of his first book, which he was hoping to be published. But Frankl was, he was Jewish. So he was arrested and taken into concentration camps. He spent three years in total in concentration camps. And he was amongst the small proportion of people who survived the camps. Only around one in 10 people survived. And he believed that the reason why he survived was because of his strong sense of purpose. What happened was that when he was arrested and taken into the camps, he was hiding the manuscript of his book in his overcoat, hoping that it would be that he would be able to take it with him as his most treasured possession. But unfortunately, the overcoat was taken off him, so he lost his book. But rather than being destroyed by that, he decided to make that his purpose to, to reimagine and reconstruct the book. So every morning that he was in the camps, he woke up with the purpose of remembering and reconstructing his book. He memorized it line by line. He wrote notes on scraps of paper. And he believed that this strong sense of purpose enabled him to survive. He was determined to survive the war so that his book could be published. And as it was published, it was published just a couple of years after the end of the war. And Frankel noticed that amongst the other inmates in the camp, he noticed that it was when people gave up hope, it was when they gave up their connection to goals and ideals, when they gave up their sense of purpose, that was when they were most vulnerable to disease or even to, you know, to, to dying. So as a psychotherapist, he tried to encourage other inmates to hang on to their sense of purpose. He encouraged them to never to give up hope of seeing their loved ones again, not to give up hope of returning to their hometowns and so forth, because he knew that that would help people to endure the terrible deprivation and the horrors of the concentration camps. And that became the, 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 the notion of purpose became the cornerstone of Frankl's psychological approach after the Second World War. He developed a, a, a psychological approach called logotherapy, which helped people to identify their sense of purpose. He also investigated what he called the existential vacuum that arises when we lose our sense of purpose and meaning. So is that, is that really true? Is it really true that as Frankl believed, a strong sense of purpose can actually um, elongate your life, can actually help you to stay alive in difficult circumstances? Well, I'm gonna illustrate that now with, uh, with some questions. I'm gonna ask you actually three questions which are originally from a research study which was published in the year 2000. So I'd like you to consider briefly these three questions. They're just yes and no questions. The first one is, are you a person who wanders aimlessly through life? So it's yes or no. Second question, do you, do you live your life one day at a time without really thinking about the future? Again, that's yes or no. And finally, do you sometimes feel as if you've done all there is to do in life? So if you answered no uh, to all of those three questions, it suggests that you have a fairly strong sense of purpose. And even more specifically, this may, may sound a bit strange, but it suggests that you have a 50% higher chance of still being alive in the year 2037. Let me, let me explain that in more detail. Those questions come from a research study which was published in the year 2000, as I just said. 
in which several thousand people were asked those questions and similar questions to identify whether they had a sense of purpose in their lives. And there was a follow-up study 14 years later, in 2014, and the follow-up study found that the people who were identified as having a strong sense of purpose had a 15% higher chance of still being alive, because obviously a number of people had died during their 14 years. So the people who were amongst the cohort of a strong sense of purpose were 15% less, were less likely to be amongst the people who had passed away in the interim period. So that does suggest that a sense of purpose can actually extend your lifespan. And beyond that, there has been a lot of research in psychology which suggests, that a power, uh, which suggests the powerful positive benefits of a, of a strong sense of purpose. Research has associated a sense of purpose with lower levels of, of cholesterol, with greater resistance to cognitive impairment in old age, uh, even with uh, better weight control. Um, but, but in psychological terms, there's a, a strong association has been found between a strong sense of purpose and happiness. Purpose is one of the strongest indicators or predictors of all of general well-being. And on the negative side, there is a strong association between per, a lack of purpose and depression and other negative psychological states. In particular, there seems to be a strong association between a lack of purpose and substance abuse and addiction. I was, I was thinking about this recently, actually. I was watching a, a documentary around the time of the World Cup a few weeks ago about the footballer Paul Gascoigne, who was one of the most famous English footballers of his generation back in the late 90s, uh, sorry, late 80s and throughout the 90s. Uh, he's probably, the, as I say, probably the most successful footballer of his era. But after his career ended, as the documentary highlighted, he suffered from a lot of problems, a lot of mental health problems, depression, uh, eating disorders, uh, also suffered from addiction, alcoholism and other addictions. And there was, a, there was a very insightful comment in the documentary from his teammate Gary Lineker, who's also a famous footballer. Gary Lineker said that Gaz's problem was that he'd never found a sense of purpose to replace uh, being a footballer. And he said that he hoped that Gaza would find a goal to help him to overcome his addictions. And that was quite an insightful comment because a sense of purpose is a very important part of recovery from addiction. You know, research shows that people who have a strong sense of purpose are much more likely to uh, overcome their addictions and less likely to relapse. I was also thinking about this in terms of, I mean, there are many indigenous communities around the world, such as the Native American communities and Ab Australian Aboriginal communities, where there is quite a high incidence of substance abuse and addiction, higher than the rest of the general population in those countries. And in my view, that's probably related to a lack of purpose and meaning because many of these peoples, their cultures have been destroyed or disrupted. They've lost touch with their traditional values, with their traditional worldview, and they've struggled. They may struggle to integrate into mainstream society. And that may lead to a lack of a sense of meaning and purpose, which can manifest itself in substance abuse and addiction. So let, let's consider now exactly why a strong sense of purpose has such powerful positive effects and also such a lack of purpose has such powerful negative effects. There are three main reasons that I'd like to highlight why purpose is so powerful. The first one, which is highlighted by the quote from Nietzsche and by Viktor Frankl's story, is that a sense of purpose gives us resilience. It enables us to overcome circumstances and situations which maybe would overwhelm us without a sense of purpose. It gives us, the de gives us the determination and motivation to overcome difficult circumstances. And one really important part of that is that that enables us to grow. As human beings, we grow through overcoming challenges. We grow through the kind of uncovering of resilience and potential which occurs when we face difficult circumstances, crises and challenges and so forth. So a sense of purpose actually enables us to grow and another factor is that a sense of purpose gives us a lot of access to positive psychological states. We've touched on this already, but you know, I'd like to highlight that a sense of purpose can give us access to optimism, to hope, because obviously we feel as though we're working towards a more positive future. And also it gives us access to the state which psychologists call flow. That's a state of intense absorption in stimulating and challenging activities. And it's, associated, it's strongly associated with well-being. It gives us a sense of inner energy, a sense of control over our own minds. And if you have a sense of purpose, it's usually connected to an activity 
which brings you into a state of flow. I get that from writing as an author, you know, my main purpose is to be an author. And that brings me a lot of flow through the act of, of writing. And finally, um, a strong sense of purpose in a corresponding negative way, it shields you from negative psychological states. That was part of my own story, how I mentioned that, how a strong sense of purpose helped me to emerge from depression and frustration and confusion. It's almost as if a strong sense of purpose seals off your mind to negative states. In, in normal life, we can feel overwhelmed by the demands of the world, by the demands and duties and responsibilities of our lives. It's almost overwhelming that we feel as though we're bombarded with so much information and, and so many demands. But if you have a strong sense of purpose, it gives you a sense of control. It sort of shields you from this overwhelming bombardment of information. You feel like you're sort of driving through your life with a sense of control and, and energy. And also in connection with depression, what one of the, the sort of root elements of depression is, you know, it's, it's, it's rumination, it's rumination on problematic issues within your life. And if you are connected to a sense of purpose, it gives you a sense of connection to something bigger. It gives you the feeling that you are part of something bigger. It gives you a wider sense of perspective. So it helps to, it helps to overcome the immersion in your own issues and problems, which is associated with depression. Now I'd like to move on to a slightly different area and what I'd like to discuss now is what I call the different varieties of purpose. Purpose is quite a kind of hom homogenous general concept and what, what I've been trying to do in my research and in my sort of theoretical uh, development is to identify different types of purpose, some of which have different effects, some of which are more strongly correlated with well-being than others. So what I'm going to do now is go through a few different types of purpose. I've actually identified seven different types, so I don't have time to go through them all, but I mentioned three or four of the most essential types of purpose. And as I describe them, maybe you can consider whether you have adopted this type of purpose in your life. You know, most people are mainly orientated around one particular type of purpose, but it could be, it could be two or even three. So the, the most basic type of purpose is survival. You know, all living beings, all animals, all human beings, their primary purpose is to stay alive and also to help their children, their offspring, to survive. So there are many people around the world whose main purpose is still survival because they live in difficult economic circumstances or in, in insecure environments. So the main purpose is simply to get by, to satisfy their basic physiological needs and the needs of their children. But once you have more or less satisfied the, the purpose of survival, then you usually move on to another kind of purpose. So that could be what I call a personal accumulative or self-accumulative purpose. So are you the kind of person who, whose main purpose is to, to build up more status, to sort of climb a ladder of professional, professional achievement, or maybe to accumulate more possessions, to accumulate more money and so forth? That's what I call a personal accumulative. Your main purpose is to accumulate. It could be to accumulate knowledge. But I mean, I work in, in academia and academics are not particularly interested in material things, but it's a very status-driven environment. You know, there's a lot of pressure to increase your, your research, research score, to get your university higher up the league table of universities. And maybe if you, you, know, if you progress, you'll end up as a professor in your later career. So it's a very competitive uh, environment in which we are encouraged to accumulate achievement. Another kind of purpose that you may have adopted is an altruistic stroke idealistic purpose. So are you the kind of person whose main role is to contribute through your activities? Maybe you're a teacher or a nurse or a, some kind of psychotherapist, health professional. Or it could be that you're a, a social activist in some way helping to overcome injustice to protect the environment. Uh, perhaps, in a more general sense, you feel like you're contributing to the world through your creative endeavours. So if that's the case, you've adopted an altruistic stroke idealistic purpose. I often think it'd be great if all politicians adopted a, an altruistic purpose. And I think they, they often pretend to, but I think most, most politicians are unfortunately driven by a kind of accumulative purpose. They're driven to you know, attract more attention and more money and achievements and so forth. Moving on to a different purpose, is, is your main purpose in life what I call self-expansive? Is the main goal in your life to, to grow, 
to grow through learning, to grow through personal development or spiritual development, maybe through creative development. The great American psychologist Abraham Maslow talked about self actualization He said that the main purpose of human beings is to grow, to expand and deepen and, and broaden ourselves. So maybe, maybe that's the main purpose of your life. But what I think is the most fulfilling and probably the most rarefied type of purpose is what I call transpersonal purpose. And that sometimes happens at the higher levels of creativity or altruism or idealism. We move into the transpersonal level. And that's when our sense of purpose is no longer a kind of conscious, voluntary thing. It's almost as if rather than having a purpose, we become a purpose. Our purpose begins to flow through us. And we become the channel of our purpose. It's a bit like the, uh, the Chinese spiritual philosophy of Taoism. They have a concept uh, called Wu Wei, which literally means actionless activity, which sounds contradictory, but it means that you act involuntarily, unconsciously. You just allow the Tao, which is the spiritual principle of the universe, to flow through you, and your life becomes the manifestation or expression of the Tao. And that's a good description of transpersonal purpose. I'm going to, yeah, let me briefly tell you the story of one of my heroes, the author D.H. Lawrence, who was a, a really perfect example of transpersonal purpose. D.H. Lawrence was, he was incredibly prolific in his short lifespan. He died at the age of 44 in 1930. He wrote over 40 books. He published hundreds of, about 800 of poems in total. He was also a painter who produced hundreds of canvases. But what's most impressive about Lawrence is not what he actually did, but the obstacles he overcame in order to, in order to produce such amazing creative works. He was born into very difficult circumstances. He was the, the son of an, an illiterate miner born into poverty in the Midlands. He was also born with ill health. He wasn't expected to survive childhood. And throughout his life, he struggled with ill health, like pneumonia, bronchitis, and tuberculosis, which eventually killed him. And also, he, he wasn't uh, taken seriously. He was a figure of ridicule. People thought of him as a crank during his lifetime. One of the things he wanted to do was to write openly about sex. Uh, but in the 1910s and the 1920s, people weren't ready for that. So people were, you know, were furious about his kind of ex sexually explicit writings. So he faced a lot of hostility. Books of his, his books were banned. His paint, exhibitions of his paintings were closed down. But Lawrence, he didn't care about that. As long as he could manifest his purpose, as long as he could allow this amazing creative work to flow through him, he didn't care about success, about wealth or anything. His main role was just to allow, that was the, you know, the most fulfilling aspect of his life, to allow his transpersonal purpose to express itself. He actually wrote a really brilliant poem called, um, it's called The Song of a Man Who Has Come Through. And it offers a really beautiful description of his own transpersonal purpose. So let me just read a, a few lines from that poem. Not I, not I but the wind that blows through me. A fine wind is blowing the new direction of time. If only I let it bear me, carry me. If only it carry me. If only I, if only I am sensitive, subtle, delicate, a winged gift. Oh, for the wonder that bubbles into my soul, I will be a good fountain, a good wellhead, will blur no whisper spoil no expression. So that's a, a beautiful description of the, the power of transpersonal purpose flowing through D.H. Lawrence. So I've mentioned a few different types of purpose there and in my university we've done quite a bit of research on the effects of those different types of purpose. So I'll explain some of those now. Basically we found that different types of purposes are more strongly associated well with well-being. When people have no purpose or, or just a survival purpose, their level of well-being tends to be quite low. And also self-accumulative purpose, well that's when you try to accumulate possessions or wealth or status, that isn't strongly associated with well-being either. It's the, the, uh, the altruistic type of purpose or the self-expansive or transpersonal purpose, they're the, the types of purpose which are most strongly associated with well-being. 
We found some interesting findings in relation to age as well. We found that young people sometimes struggle to identify their purpose, but when people grow older into their 40s and 50s, they tend to have a stronger sense of purpose. And they also tend to gravitate towards an altruistic or self-expansive purpose. A self-accumulative purpose tends to be mainly the preserve of younger people in the 18 to 24 and old, slightly older group. We also found uh, some slight differences in gender too. We found that women, uh, for reasons which are not entirely clear, are more, seem to be more likely to adopt a transpersonal purpose. So I think the main finding of our research is that um, a self-accumulative purpose is not particularly strongly associated with the well-being, whereas the other types of purpose, self-expansive, altruistic or transpersonal, are strongly associated with well-being. Another area that I've investigated in my research is a phenomenon which I call transformation through turmoil. That's when people go through very difficult circumstances, they go through crises, major crises in their lives. It could be a diagnosis of serious illness such as cancer, it could be bereavement, it could be a period of addiction, even incarceration, uh, even a period as a, as a soldier in a, in a battle zone. Some people, when they go through these situations, they don't, rather than breaking down, they actually undergo a kind of shift up into a higher level of being. They, they, it's almost like a spiritual awakening. It's a, a very profound transformation that some people undergo. They, found that, they find that they have a new sense of appreciation. They don't take anything for granted anymore. They feel a basic sense of gratitude for life itself. And they, they feel that their relationships are stronger to other people. They feel more connected, more empathic towards other people. They feel more connected to nature. They have a greater sense of the beauty of nature. But another part of their transformation is an enhanced sense of purpose. There are actually, there are actually two ways in which they change in relation to purpose. They have a, a much stronger sense of purpose. And also they shift from an accumulative purpose, if they have one before, towards an altruistic purpose. That pattern repeats again and again. One person described it as a shift away from taking from the world to giving to the world. Let, let me give you a couple of brief examples. Uh, the first example is a woman who features in my book, Extraordinary Awakenings, called Jill Hicks. So in 2005, she was caught up in the, the terrorist attack in London, um, where, where several tube trains were bombed and also buses. So Jill Hicks happened to be sitting very close to one of the suicide bombers in, the, in a tube train near King's Cross. She was, she was very severely injured. She actually lost her legs below the knee. And for days, she hovered on the brink of death in hospital. She actually had a kind of classic near-death experience in which she left her body, floated into space and felt incredibly peaceful. But she felt she had to return to her body. And when, once she regained consciousness and began to recover, she realized that she was a different person. She actually said that she was living a new life. She called it life two. And the main aspect of her new life was a sense of gratitude, a sense of appreciation of the, the smallest things in life, just the ability to see the beauty of nature, to be with other people, to drink and eat. All of these things seemed to be amazing blessings that she'd taken for granted before. She also felt a new sense of altruism. She'd previously been a, a successful professional person, a, a designer or architect, but she wanted to do something more, kind of more productive and more altruistic with her life. Let me just read a couple of quotes from her memoir which describe this amazing transformation that she went through. She said, From the moment I was given the option of choosing life, I vowed that I would never take anything for granted, all that I have, never take anything for granted again. And the next quote describes a new sense of purpose. She said, My path is being laid and being lit every day. I can see so clearly where I'm meant to be going. It's like an airport runway, where the bright lights along the strip guide the planes in. So this, this new sense of purpose, she channeled it into community action, into charity work. She founded a, a charity called Mad for Peace. She spent the next few years campaigning and giving talks to communities throughout the UK. And eventually she returned to Australia and became involved in politics to try to contribute to the world. Another brief example is a lady called Irene. She's, she was called Irene Murray. In 2002, she was diagnosed with breast cancer 
and told that she maybe only had six to nine months left to live. But rather than being broken down by that, she immediately shifted into a new way of seeing the world. This is how she described it after she was diagnosed with cancer, straight after she was diagnosed. She said, it was the first time I'd seen death as a reality and realized that life is just temporary. The following day I woke up and thought, I'm just so lucky to be alive, the fact that I'm still here. The air was so clean and fresh and everything I looked at seemed so vibrant and vivid. The trees were so green and everything was so alive. I became aware of this energy radiating from the trees. I had a tremendous feeling of connectedness. And that became her ongoing permanent state. She said that it slightly de-intensified, but at a sl slightly low level of intensity, she remained in that higher, in that state of higher awareness. And she was incredibly fortunate in that her cancer went into remission, but she retained retain this heightened awareness. And just as with Jill Hicks, it meant that she, she felt obliged to change her life. She'd also been a successful professional person. She was an IT manager at a pharmaceutical company, but she wanted to do something more altruistic, more meaningful in her life. So she, she retrained as a therapist, became a counselor and a therapist for other cancer patients. She started to write poetry and she felt as though she began to live truly for herself, authentically, rather than for other people. So those are some of the amazing ways in which um, transformation through turmoil can affect people, especially in terms of their, their purpose. As I say, there is a shift from an accumulative purpose towards a much more altruistic purpose and also a much more authentic purpose. So I'd like to, I'd like to reflect on that for a moment. Actually, I'd like to guide you through a brief exercise I think the main element of people like Jill and Irene, the main element of their transformation is quite simple really. It's an encounter with their own mortality. I think as human beings, we tend to take life for granted. It's almost as if we're programmed to think of ourselves as immortal. You know, subconsciously, we kind of, we're kind of programmed into thinking that we're never gonna die. But once you confront mortality, once you realize that life is fragile, precious, and temporary, then it shifts your perspective and there's a movement towards a more authentic purpose. So in order to reflect on that, I'm gonna give you a brief exercise which I sometimes use with my students or at participants um, in my workshops. And it's called a year to live exercise. So I'd just like to break some bad news to you. Unfortunately, you only have one year left to live. The date of your death has been established as the 17th of January, 2024. So you only have 365 days, um, 12 months, 52 weeks left in this, on this planet, in this body to live. So I'd like you to consider for a moment, how are you gonna spend the last year of your life? What are you gonna do? How are you gonna spend it in the most meaningful and productive way? So you reflect on that for a moment. You could think, you could think, of, it, think of it in terms of purpose. Are you going to follow an, an accumulative purpose to try to buy more things, to try to have as much fun as possible? Actually, you know, maybe you're like one of my students who said a while ago, I'm going to spend my last year taking as many drugs as possible and having as much sex as possible. That's fine if that's what you want to do. But maybe you want to follow a more altruistic purpose, maybe contribute to your community or to the world maybe leave you know, some creativity to share your wisdom with the world? Or are you gonna spend the last 12 years, sorry, 12 months of your life following a self-expansive purpose? Maybe meditating to enhance your spiritual development. Maybe could be creativity again, trying to be as creative as possible to leave your message or your wisdom behind. Or maybe you know, just trying to love the people around you, spending time with the people around you perhaps spending time in nature, maybe, you know, to prepare for your departure, to prepare for your, for your journey beyond this life. So briefly consider that for a moment. How are you gonna spend that final year of your life? 